we'll get started with the uh, at home prayer here. Oh, we're to right, let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. With our uh, hymn of the month. Um, 
so we should talk about the end times more. We should sing about the end times more. Um, I think these are good hymns, and they're worth singing, and uh, it, it's worth thinking about. Right? It's it's worth thinking about death. Right? I think a lot of it, it's interesting. Our I mean, our society. Um, I don't know if you're. This is more of a side note, but if you're at all familiar with the idea of transhumanism, it's a pretty popular idea in academia today, and not just in academia, but really in pop culture, that uh, we should at one point be able to upload our consciences, our uh, our uh, consciousness to some sort of computer, right, and live forever, right. This is. Um, in some sense, the end, the eschatology, the study of the last things for the world is that the world thinks that we'll be able to live forever. Um, and th this takes shape in a number of different ways. I mean, some people literally think we'll just all be eventually become robots and upload our consciousness to our robots and get rid of these bodies, mm -hmm. right? But um, there's other types of kind of transhumanistic Right, which means transhumanist is like to be above a human, right? Um, which, according to the Bible, humans are the crown of creation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, uh, you know, I'm kind of, you guys know me, I'm kind of into like health and, and fitness stuff. Well, within that world, there's this new new topic that's very popular that people talk about, about uh, longevity, right? Like basically how do we extend the lifespan of our, the health span of humans, um, like how, what are the best ways and tools to deal with things like heart disease and and uh, cancer and all these things, which of course, you know, to some degree that's not a bad question, right, we should want to be healthy, but you notice when you listen to people who talk about longevity is they do start to get a little transhumanist, right, they, you'll hear them start to talk about, well, you know, once we get this all figured out, um, you know, my maybe my my parents live to be eighty or ninety, you know, but I'm gonna live to be one hundred and twenty. I'm gonna live to be one hundred and thirty. That they, they there's this very optimistic view that basically people think they're gonna keep living on forever. And I always want to ask him, yeah, but what if you die in a car crash tomorrow? You know, like what? That, that's great. You figure out all the health stuff you do. I mean, you do all these protocols to, to deal to that you're never going to get sick. You're, you're going to be healthy when you're 90 years old. You're going to be running marathons when you're 90 years old or whatever that is that they want to do. That's great. You're still going to die, right? Even if, even if someone can live to be 120, great. You live to be 120, then what? You know, you're still going to die. And what, if, and what if you die in an accident? Like, you, you have to deal with the fact that life is fragile. The wages of sin is death. And um, anyway, we can talk more about transhumanism. If you so want. what is it? What do... Yeah, go ahead. Our guess is fear. Fear of not continuing on or something. Yeah, I think it's ultimately idolatry of the, of the self. It's pride. It's sinful human pride. Is that um, we don't want to admit that there is a God who punishes sin and that the punishment of that sin in, in human life is death, right? And we all have to deal with that. And um, there's a couple different ways to deal with that. One is by pride and trying to push it as far back as possible. Right, try and it's kind of like it, it's very analogous to like Jonah trying to hide by going to the bottom of a ship and heading to Tar heading to Tarshish. Right, it's like I don't want to deal with this thing that God told me I need to deal with, and so I'm just going to pretend like He doesn't exist and like He can't see me. <laughs> right, and it just is when you read it, it's ridiculous. <laughs> It's so obvious, but that doesn't stop people from doing it, right? Plenty of people live their lives trying to hide from truth, right? And this is especially easy today. Like, and if you work a nine to five job, let's just say, and you 
you know, basically stay busy at work, you know, doing whatever you do. And then you, you come home, you eat dinner, you watch a couple hours of Netflix, you take some drugs to help you sleep, and then you go to bed and you wake up and do it the next day. You don't have to think a lot about life, right? You don't have to think a lot about like the meaning of life or or death or whatever. You can basically by entertainment, like by the by entertainment media and by drugs, you you can just avoid thinking about a lot, right? Uh, and a lot of people live this way. And uh, you know, even at work, people have headphones in, and they you know, pay, people rarely sit in silence nowadays. There's always some sort of talking, music, something, right? Which I mean, that's sitting in silence. I like silence. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and especially outside silence, right? People are anyway. There's like the people are rarely outside in nature anymore, and this. Uh, I don't know how we got here from the bridegroom soon will call us, but people rarely sit outside in nature anymore and, and, and in silence. And basically what I'm saying is I think people are out of touch with reality. A lot of people are. They're just out of touch with reality. It's like constant media consumption and constant lack of nature. And um, I heard someone talking about this recently and they said like, if you ask you know, your average American about like whatever thing that they're into, they can tell you 20 different brands of whatever consumer product that they're, you know, is, is whatever they're into. Um, but they can't tell you the difference between an oak leaf and a maple leaf, mm. right? And what that shows is that this isn't just some sort of environmental thing. What that shows is that people are out of touch with reality, right? They care about trivial things, not about real things. Right, and um, one good litmus test for this is like, what are you going to care about on your deathbed? Right, when you do eventually come to the point of death, like, who are you going to want to see and what are you going to want to talk about? You're probably not going to want to talk about the numbers in your bank account or about like the new Netflix show that you just discovered. Right, that's not what you that's not what matters. So, um, anyway. But as far as the transhumanism thing, I think that's part of it is that people just don't want to deal with the reality of death, right? And so they're trying to just avoid it by trying to somehow defeat death on their own, right? Which that's ultimately what sinners are going to try and do, right, is uh, try and justify themselves so that they can defeat death on their own. This has been the age, the age old story. That's what the Pharisees were trying to do, right? The Pharisees said, we're gonna try and find a way to salvation without, without Jesus, right? Um, that's what the, the pagans in the Bible were trying to do too, right? We got, we got our gods for all the things we need. We don't need Jesus. So it's always trying to deal with that on some level. All right. Um, in the catechism memory work, plus there's any more on that. Um, anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all the things the instructor do not receive. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. I want to talk about that. A man reaps what he sows. So I think you, someone could take that. A man reaps what he sows and say. Oh, look, Christians believe in karma, right? The Bible talks about karma. Um, karma is an, you know, an Eastern philosophy idea that, you know, you get what's coming to you. You know, if you, if you put good vibes out in the world, you get good things back. If you put bad vibes out in the world, you can get bad things back. That's a word that kids use a lot nowadays. The, uh, like the college students are always talking about vibes. Um, it's like an older word, though. I think that's like a, more like a hippie word. I was just going to say good vibes. Yeah, yeah, that, it's come back. The vibes have come back. Anyway, um, that's beside the point. Uh, but that's not exactly what reaping and sowing is about. It's, it's not about karma. Um, the I, idea here 
really has to do with nature. So kind of like what we were just talking about is that God created the world, right? And God created the world that things work in an organic way. There, there is a, a natural way in which things work according to their nature, right? So if you go back to Genesis, right, what is, what's the phrase that's constantly repeated in, in Genesis 1, aside from like talking about the days, is... It is good. Yeah, well, it, and it was good. There's a, it's actually, it's kind of a poem, so there's a lot of repetition, but one of the repeated phrases in Genesis 1 is um, that they will produce according to their kind, mm -hmm. right? So the trees are going to reproduce trees, right? The trees aren't going to create foxes. The trees are going to create more trees, right? Whenever their seed falls and then it sprouts. And, and the foxes are going to create more foxes, right? They're not going to create bears or something like that, right? Things reproduce according to their kinds, right? When humans have children, they're human children, right? And so this is the idea of reaping and sowing. It's the it's an agricultural idea. It's that you put a seed in the ground, and whatever the nature of that seed is, that's what's going to grow up, right? Well, that's true with the way you live your life, too, right? If you sow seeds of destruction in your life, you're going to reap destruction, right? If you sow holiness in your life, you're going to reap holiness, right? you got to put in good things so that good things come out, right? And that's not a karma uh, type of thing, right? Um, and the, the same is true with our relationship with other people is that when we sow kindness, when we sow love toward our neighbor, right, then things are going to work better in our lives, right? And we're going to see graciousness in our lives, while we're being gracious because that's the nature of creation. That's how God created the world to work, right? Now, that, it's not karma. It's not some sort of mysterious thing where it's like there's the universe's, mother universe is somehow controlling this to happen. It's that God created the world in a certain way and that whatever is sown, that's what's going to grow up in that place, right? Um, and so in the church, right, this, this is a stewardship verse, right? In the church, the, the pastor and the people are supposed to sow good things to one another, right? They're supposed to share good things with one another, right? So the pastor shares the gospel with the people. The people um, who uh, receive the instruction share all good things with the instructor, right? Basically, it's talking about, on a very basic level, the pastor getting paid, right? which I'm very appreciative, by the way, um, that uh, we sow good things with one another so that we can then reap the benefits of the church, right? This is how the church is supposed to work. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's something to think about is that idea of reaping and sowing. This, is, um, this has to do with the nature of things, right? So, and um, the, the point of it being connected to stewardship too is that like, you don't, uh, stewardship is not this thing where if you hold back, it's going to be of any, like, benefit to you, right? So if, um, if someone is being, uh, purposely, like, stingy with their stewardship, they're not going to reap the benefits that they could be reaping, right? And it's not... We, we always have to be careful, right? Because it's not like uh, you, it's not like a prosperity gospel thing, right? It's not like a Joel Osteen thing where it's like, just give me enough money and then you're going to be more blessed, right? He would abuse verses like this. But um, there is a sense in which when, when you steward according to God's word and cheerfully and, and thoughtfully and, and all the ways that the Bible describes, that there is a, a reaping of a benefit there. Um, yeah, Steve? You know, the discussion comes up about tithing on the gross amount that you take in or the net, you know, after taxes. There is a little difference there. Right. And, you know, so I guess if you, uh, according to this, if you tithe on the gross, you'd be less poor, but it's not necessarily true, I guess. Yeah, it's not necessarily uh Sure. I mean, I think stewardship, we are free in the gospel, so stewardship is one of these things 
um, in the in the new covenant that each person has to and, and Paul talks this way each person needs to decide for themselves what's right right and I always tell people start with 10% and then you know go from there and figure out if you need to give like if you're if 10 percent's causing you problems you know financially then then give less like if you can't give 10 percent, that's fine and and you can start with 10 percent gross or 10 percent net it really doesn't matter to me um you know god is going to provide but uh you know each person needs to kind of figure that out for themselves right and um i think this is why paul gives maybe a little bit broader uh, instructions here than just exactly 10%. And this is the beauty of the New Testament is that there can be, we can we can broaden it out from this kind of legalistic principle to more broad principles. But one of these principles is that a man reaps what he sows, right? And that notice what precede, precedes that, right? God cannot be mocked. Again, this, ha this has to do with nature, right? God created the world to work in a certain way. He created the church to work in a certain way. Um, you can't just uh, act like God didn't make the, the world or the church to work in this way, right? Um, pastors have to be paid, right? That's <laughs> uh, at a certain point. Now, um, I, let me also say this, too, as um, our economy is, is struggling um, there are different ways to pay pastors too. Like, uh, there, you know, I've I've been paid in mechanic work. I've been paid in goat meat. I've been paid in a number of different ways before, right? So that that's fine, right? And I, I also, you know, very much appreciate the salary, but um, we we might need to get a little more creative as. I don't know what the future holds. I can't pretend. I'm not an economist. I don't know what the future holds. But um, I will say that just that, again, we, I don't think we need to get caught up necessarily in the, like, you know, what's after the dollar sign amount, like, you know, really uh, intensely. But we should take these broader principles and think about them. Probably. Yeah. Jeff, did you have something? Oh, no, no, no. I was uh, stretching, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to Jeremiah. We have um, a lot to get through. And I, I didn't realize how many more verses we still had here. So we'll have to kind of work through them. All right. So I went ahead and listed out the rest of the key passages that we're going to go through from Jeremiah. We're about halfway through the book. Here. So 26, chapter 26, 1 through 24. Um, I'm not going to read all of it, but uh, we can skim some of it here. So uh, this is, uh, I, I mentioned whenever we started talking about Jeremiah that one of the things that happens in Jeremiah is that he himself is persecuted and writes about it, right? So it's... Um, a very personal book in that way, and we and we also see the the downfall of Judah in the life of Jeremiah. Okay, so basically, what's happening here is that uh, Jeremiah is uh, speaking in front of the people, and uh, this is at the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, Judah, and. Uh, he stands in the court of the Lord's house. So he's speaking basically to, to the king and to the government, right? And he starts preaching the law, right, to these kings. And the priests and the prophets and all the people, this is verse 7, heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it happened when Jeremiah had made an end of the speaking of all the Lord had commanded him to speak to the people, the priests and the prophets and all the people seized him, saying, You will surely die. Right, so and another thing we have going on here is to go back to the last, one of the last things we talked about is the wickedness of the leadership of Judah. 
right? So it's not just the king, but also the priest and the, pro the other priests and the other prophets who are persecuting Jeremiah here. You will surely die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and the city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Okay. Now when, Jer when, the, now when the princes of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate in the Lord's house. And the priests and the prophets spoke to the princes and all the people, saying, This man deserves to die. Um, this should sound very familiar. What does this sound like? This sounds like the fair, mm -hmm. the, it sounds like the Sanhedrin going to the Roman government and saying this man deserves to die. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it, it's uh, very messianic in that sense. Um, then Jeremiah spoke to the princes and all the people saying, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against the city. Now therefore amend your ways and your doings. And <laughs> Jeremiah, um, he's very courageous, right? He's very courageous here. And that he's got the other the priests and the prophets telling the government, hey, this man deserves to die. And Jeremiah said, oh, I'm glad you're here too. You need to also amend your ways, <laughs> right? Um, oh, that's great. Okay. Um, as for me, this is verse 14. Here I am. I'm in your hand. Do with me as seems good and proper to you. But know for certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves, on the city, on its inhabitants. For the, truly the Lord has sent me to speak against uh, to you to speak all these words in your hearing. Um, and so then the people, this is very interesting, the princes and all the people said to the priests and prophets, and here's another uh, theme we have here. Well, let me read it first. This is verse 16. This man does not deserve to die, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. So the people all of a sudden change their tune, right? And one of the things you can see there, uh, a couple things, is first of all, the, the word of the Lord is powerful, right? Um, it, it would have been easy for Jeremiah to say, oh, so I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, right? Um, whenever, whenever the princess came and he was about to be put to death. But instead he, he continued to speak the word of the Lord. But they responded to it. Right? The word of the Lord is powerful. It can bring repentance. And, um, I mean, I mentioned Jonah earlier, right? Like, what does Jonah do? Jonah goes into the city of Nineveh and shouts a two-sentence sermon and where barely anyone could hear him and, he, and the whole city comes to repentance. Right? <clears throat> the word of the Lord is powerful. The second thing you can see here is that um, people are fickle. Right, um, pe people will, and the priests and the prophets, right, and and the kings, they they're constantly going back and forth on what they believe, right, and and who they're going to listen to, and it's not that it's not real repentance whenever they turn back to the Lord. I mean, I think it is in a sense real repentance, but it's important to recognize this in other people, and also in ourselves, that we're not as strong as we think we are. Like, we're, we're liable to say one thing on Sunday morning, and then possibly change our tune the next, the next day, right? And I, I mean, I've caught myself doing this before, right? I've caught myself like, you know, have a really good devotion in the morning or whatever, and kind of be, I, <laughs> I use this, phrase somewhat jokingly but you know kind of be like on fire for Jesus for the day right and then mid afternoon I catch myself in some stupid sin you know um, who hasn't that happened to and and this is how people are right people are fickle uh, and that, that's part of the nature of sin and so we need to recognize that and, and and what we recognize in that is that we constantly need God's word right we constantly need his forgiveness we constantly need his uh, word to help us and motivate us and encourage us and strengthen us. Right. Um, all right. Um, later on, Jeremiah ends up getting taken at, into captivity uh, after the destruction of, of Jerusalem. So we'll have to read about that in a little bit. 
So uh, 31, verse, chapter 31, verses 31. I'm just going to read all of this paragraph here. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, by covenant which they broke, though I was husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. All right, so this language of new covenant, um, we it's, it's kind of funny because we use this language all the time, right? The old covenant and the new covenant. Now, it does come up in the New Testament, right? When uh, And where does it come up specifically? In the words of institution of the Lord's Supper, right? This is the new covenant in my blood. And so we know that this is the new covenant, right? That Jesus' blood shed on the cross, given to us to drink in the Lord's Supper. This is the That's the blood of the new covenant. And, and the New Covenant in general is what we, I mean, and we even give the Bible these two names, right? The Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Old Testament and New Testament. Those words are interchangeable, right? So we even give the Bible those names. But um, maybe we should talk a little bit about what a, what a covenant is. Anyway, what I want to say real quickly, though, is that the, the Old Testament, it doesn't really use that language of New Covenant very often, right? Because... Well, one, since it is the Old Testament, when it just talks about the covenant, right? The covenant that's current, right? Which is the covenant um, that's, I mean, it's really first made with Adam and Eve. Then it's kind of ratified with Abraham. And then it's really renewed, in a sense, with um, Moses and, and the Passover is the big moment, right? That's, that's what Jeremiah references, is the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And so this is the Old Covenant. Um, but this is the one prophecy we do get in the Old Testament that, the, that a new covenant is coming. We get a lot of prophecies about Jesus, right? About the Messiah coming. But we don't get a ton of prophecies really about the idea of a new covenant, right? Uh, and the idea that that, that Messiah is going, that, that there's going to be some sort of fundamental change, right? Um, but we do understand that and and we'll talk about that in a second. The, so the idea of a covenant, though, is that a covenant is a contract, right? And you can see he compares it to the marriage covenant, right? He says, I was their husband, right? The, the Lord says, um, let's see, where is that? Yeah, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, right? That's verse 32. Um, it's like a marriage contract, right? And what it, I mean, a marriage is more than a contract, but it is a contract, right? It's a legal contract that two people are going to be united together and they're going to love and cherish each other and they're not going to separate from each other, you know, until death do us part, right? And you sign the document, right? A marriage license, it's a, it's a covenant, it's a contract, right? And, and you take vows. So both sides of the contract have things that they're supposed to uphold, right? Um, and if, one of those sides breaks those vows, then they're breaking the contract, they're breaking the covenant. Right? And there's attendant blessings and consequences for keeping the, the contract and for breaking the contract. Right? Well, the same thing is true with God and his people. Right? He makes a promise to them that uh, he will be their God and they will be his people, and their, their side of the contract is to uphold his law. Right? He gives them these statutes, he gives them these laws, Right? In the Old Covenant, he gives them three types of laws. He gives them a moral law, a civil law, and ritual law. And his promise to them is that he's going to have mercy on them, and he's going to save them. And ultimately, his promise to them is that he's going to bring about a Messiah. Right? Well, the people are really bad at breaking the covenant. They break it all the time. Right? And it's akin to adultery right? in a marriage. Uh, and this is... Um, all over the place in the, in the prophets of the Old Testament is that the people of Judah, the people of Israel, they're like an adulterous people, 
right? They, they're constantly leaving their husband, the Lord, and, and cheating on him, right? But the beautiful thing is, in the, in the Bible, this is kind of the whole point of the, the, the Bible in a sense, is that God doesn't break his end of the bargain. And even though he could just leave them, right? He could just say, screw this, you guys broke the contract, and legally, God could just say, okay, everyone's going to hell now, right? Uh, legally, God, God could say, the contract's broken, I'm not going to have anything to do with it anymore, right? You guys broke the contract, not me. He doesn't, right? He reconciles with his people. And the way that he reconciles the old covenant is by establishing a new covenant, right? By the blood of his son. And in some sense, that was the plan all along, right? So um, this is the idea here. And uh, one thing I want to point out here is that um, he doesn't say that whenever he makes this new covenant, that the people aren't going to be, be, re, uh, be responsible anymore, that the people aren't... He does say he's going to forgive their iniquity and their sin he's not going to remember. But he doesn't say, like, the people aren't going to have to live a certain way or that the people aren't going to have anything to uphold anymore. I think this is a, a mistake that can be made with the gospel. Is like, oh, God brought the new covenant and we have forgiveness by the blood of Christ. So now the new covenant is basically God forgives us and we don't do anything. That's not what he says here. What does he say? He says he's basically going to renew the laws. right? He says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, um, and they shall know me from the greatest of, of them to the least. right? So he doesn't say the law... And especially as, as we come to know it as, from the teaching of Jesus, that the law is just going to be like meaningless or just go away, right? But that when he saves his people, when he forgives their sins, when the blood has, has washed away their sins, they're going to know him even better. And they're going to love his law even more, right? And um, the law is going to be on their minds and on their hearts, right? like it was supposed to be back in Deuteronomy 6. So um, that's an important point, uh, is that the new covenant doesn't do away with the law. Right? What does Jesus say? I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Right? He fulfills it on our behalf, and then, but then we still love it. right? And we want to follow him. The new spirit wants to, to live in his law. All right. That's enough of that. All right, uh, any questions on the New Covenant? Moving forward then, I'm just flying through these, chapter 36, verses 20 to 32. And I'm not going to read all of this, I'll just tell you the story. I'm just kind of skim through it. Okay, so um, Jeremiah goes to read the scroll in the palace. Uh, to the king, and he has his scribe with him, Baruch, and uh, Jeremiah reads the scroll, and uh, the king sends a guy, one of his servants, named Jehudi, to bring the scroll, and he took it uh, from the scribe's chamber, and Jehudi read it in the hearing of the king, in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king, that's verse, around verse 21. And he had a fire burning uh, in a hearth near him. And after this Jehudi had read a couple of the columns, the king cut the scroll with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire. And the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. So this is, I mean, this is part of the book of Jeremiah that he's reading, right? So Jeremiah prophesies um, from, he gets a prophecy from the Lord, he writes it down on a scroll, and then he reads it. Um, so this was the, the first copy of the book of Jeremiah, part of the part of the book of Jeremiah, right? Or what would be the book of Jeremiah. And the king uh, tears it, or cuts it in half and then throws it into the fire, right? And then it says, yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments. 
the king warning the servants who heard all these words. Uh, nevertheless, a couple of different of uh, his servants there uh, told him not to burn it, but he would not listen to them. Okay, and then he commanded them to seize Baruch, the scribe of Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord hid them. Now, after the king had burned the scroll with the words which Baruch had written at the instruction of Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Take yet another scroll, and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. And you shall say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Thus says the Lord, You have burned the scroll, saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land, and cause man and beast to cease from here? Right? And notice, <laughs> this is... Kind of hilarious, right? Because what, why does Jehoiakim burn the scroll? Because he doesn't like what it says. Yeah. Right? And so he's like, I'm just not going to deal with it. Right? It's like if you got your, uh, you know. Like cancel culture. Yeah, it, it is like cancel culture. Right? Well, I was just like, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's well, like, today, yeah. yeah, you just don't, you don't like when someone says something that's true. And so you just, you just cancel it. Right? You just pretend like it doesn't exist. Right? Um, but the thing is, again, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier at the beginning of Bible study. It's like, Pete, you're, it's like being out of touch with reality. Because it's not like those things are going to go away. Right? Um, it's, it's not like, you know, so if someone gets canceled for um, saying that, you know, transgenderism is an abomination to human creation. Uh, it's not like that fact just goes away if that person gets canceled, right? It's, it's not as if if we just cancel enough people then we can change biology, right? <laughs> you just can't do it. And no matter how hard Jehoiakim tried, Babylon was coming, right? You can't just throw the piece of paper away and pretend it's not happening, right? It's like if you get a bit of a bill in the mail and you don't want to pay it, so you just throw it away, throw it in the fire. Like the collection company doesn't care. I'm sorry, you know. Um, so anyway, it's kind of funny. But that so this is the point, right? So Je the Lord um, tells Jeremiah to rewrite it and then to go and take it back to Jehoiakim and. Uh, and give this prophecy to Jehoiakim. So back in verse 30. He shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast to the heat of the day and to the frost of the night. I will punish him, his family, and his servants and their, for their iniquity, and I will bring on them the inhabitants of Jerusalem and on the men of Judah all the doom that I pronounced against them, that, but they did not heed. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it at the instruction of Jeremiah on the words of the book of Jehoiakim, the, uh, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned with fire, and besides, there were added to them many similar words. Okay? And um, the point here is, so notice that last line, that not only did he rewrite the scroll, and this time it survived, but he actually added words of the Lord to it. And the point here is that the word of the Lord wins. Right? You can't get rid of the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is powerful and the word of the Lord wins. And that's one of the themes in the book of Jeremiah, right, is that the inactive word is efficacious. The word that Jeremiah brings, the word that the Lord gives, it does what it says, right? And what the Lord says does happen. It does come true. And um, that goes for both the punishment of the law, right? Like Jehoiakim had the experience. It also goes for the things he says, like we were talking about, about the new covenant, that God will forgive the sins of his people. His word does what it says. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so then in chapter uh, 38 and 39, we get the... Uh, fall of Jerusalem, and also this is where we find out that Jeremiah uh, is imprisoned um, for prophesying about the fall of Jerusalem that's going to happen. 
Um, so that, that uh, you can read in chapter 38 about Jeremiah's imprisonment if you want. I'm going to go ahead and jump over to 39, uh, verses 1 through 10. This is the first... So like I, if you remember what I said about Jeremiah, is that Jeremiah is a collection of writings. It's not um, one solid prophecy from beginning to end. And so there's not a clear timeline in Jeremiah. So one of the things that happens is in chapter 39, we get um, the, the fall of Jerusalem told for the first time. But then we get that again in chapter uh, 52. And it's the same event, but he tells it two different ways. Right? It's, it's very similar to like the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, John tells about the coming of Jesus Christ multiple times in multiple ways throughout the entire book. Right? Um, it's, so it's a kind of a layered approach rather than a... Uh, linear approach, if that makes sense. Okay. So, in, in the, in, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, we covered the fall of Jerusalem, uh, the account from the Second Kings, before, a while back. Um, I'll just start at verse 5 and read. But the Oh, never mind. I will stop there. All right. Um, I mean, y'all know about the, the, the Babylonian cap captivity of Jerusalem. Um, you can read chapter 38 and 39 if you want. And then we'll, uh, we'll pick back up around, around here next time. All right. Let's end in a word prayer. Any final questions, comments about Jeremiah so far? Is, is, the Babylon, is this the Babylonian captivity that they're going yes. into that is yes. where the, the town move comes from? Yeah, I mean, that's centuries later. Oh, okay. So this is not the same. No, that, that's, uh, is that, the uh, Babylonian town is like 300-something uh, AD. This is like um, 600 BC or something like that. Oh, okay. Third. Gotta double check the dates on that. When is the the Babylonian captive? Do you, does anyone have that? Yeah. Don't worry about it. We'll all look at it next time. It's like 640 BC or something? 586 BC. 586 BC. That was 100 years old. Alright, <laughs> right, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day. We pray that you bless our worship today in spirit and in truth, and we pray that you would uh, continue to keep the promise of the new covenant in your blood before our eyes. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Inside.